sometimes on occasion when you come here, you might have an anxiety, something that's on your mind, and you just want somebody at church to pray for you briefly. And if that's true, whenever you come here, in between services and also after this service, uh, there's a little small team of people over there against that wall behind that camera. There's a little sign that says prayer team, and there'll be people there that are part of our prayer ministry at the crossing who will pray for you briefly uh, for what you have that you'd like them to pray. Just on occasion, that might be something that's true for you, so you want to make that available. A little over 10 years ago, maybe a little bit, maybe about 15 years ago, uh, there was a guy who was an atheist, but his wife came to church on Easter Sunday with her dad and stepmom, and she just happened to bring home a book that we were passing out that day to anybody who wanted one called The Case for Easter. It's a chapter out of Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ, on just evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And she just happened to take it home, and her atheist husband found it, and uh, we made a story about that of about 10 years ago, maybe a little more, that I just want to show right now here. Just let him tell it in his own words. Hi, I'm Scott Myers, and I'm a photographer. Through my 20s and 30s, I really went out of my way to avoid believing in anything that could have possibly put any sort of limitations on my desires. And by the time I was 40, I considered myself an atheist. The biggest way that my worldview showed up in my art was just in the bleakness of a lot of the images. I was really drawn to dark, run down, broken places. There was really no room for people in my photos. A lot of times there were places where people had been, but people weren't there anymore. They were gone. There was just this sense of brokenness and decay. I spent years photographing flooded houses. I thought it was fit perfectly with what I wanted to photograph. Old historic houses that had been flooded and abandoned. There was just pain in there. You could just feel it. I was drawn to that. I never saw myself as being really broken in that sense, other than that was the end of everything. Everything ended that way, and just abandonment and decay and darkness. A world without God is dark and hopeless and meaningless. I mean, you can try to put a layer of human meaning on top of it, but in the end, it, it's all arbitrary. It's all flux and it's all moving and changing and there's nothing to really put your finger on to say this is true, except that you will die. And that is true. That's the one truth in a world without God is that your life will end and you will suffer before then. It's bleak. It's a, it's a bleak, dark way to see the world really feel sorry for people that continue to feel that way. I mean, I know what it was like, and it, it was just really dark. I was not happy in any sense of the word, you know? I mean, it's like, I was, I was just miserable then. I did not want to uh, pass that on to my, my kids. Yes, I think something's wrong when, you know, you can't or you're afraid to explain to your children the way the world works. That was one of the things that motivated me, got me thinking and reading good books and realizing that Christianity is not what I thought it was. My wife uh, brought home a copy of The Case for Easter I started reading it on a whim and was kind of shocked at the impact that it had on me. I realized that I had rejected a cartoon version of Christianity and that I had made up without ever understanding the, the real thing. I didn't have a moment when I accepted Jesus Christ. It was a process over weeks and months. I knew I was changed when I was not only comfortable, but also absolutely compelled to fall on my knees and beg Jesus to have mercy on my wretched soul. 
one of the obvious things that has changed in my photography, after God changing the way that I, I view the world, is color. Color just has this amazing potential to express things in a magical way that you just can't do in black and white. I think a lot of my work has gotten uh, very big and, and painterly and a lot of it is, is really just abstract color and natural patterns and light. A lot of the subject matter for the color tends to be nature photographed in a way that kind of shows this orderly madeness of creation. How it's not randomness and it's not chaos. There is an order to it. The biggest, most dramatic change that I've seen in my photography is my interest in photographing people. I never wanted to do that before and now that's all I want to do. The technical part of it isn't what it's about. It's about that interaction with other people. The only way that you can ever get somebody to look and give you an honest expression in a photograph is that they have to open up and they have to let down their mask and they have to relax and, and trust me. And the only way that they're going to do that is if I do the same thing first. I never wanted that in the past. I really, really did not want that. Because it was fear. I mean, it was, it was fear that, of interacting with other people that kept me from doing it. I mean, God has just totally changed my heart on it to where that's what I want to do. It's, it's almost the exact opposite of what I was doing before. And that really kind of coincides with a growing understanding of the Gospels and this kind of developing faith and trust in, in God. The world without God is like, you're down in this dank basement dungeon. And if you don't know that the sun is out there, <laughs> or you deny that the sun is out there, you still have a longing for something other than the darkness. God wants to take you out of that, put you in the sun. Now, I think it's true that what we believe about God or, or don't believe about God is a kind of lens through which we observe and through which we see every circumstance and situation in our lives. But it's, and we have to admit it, it's also true that often our circumstances, and especially our circumstances that bring us anxiety, often cause us to forget what we believe about God. In the moment, we sort of forget what we say we believe and what we actually do believe. It's just kind of how life works. Our anxieties are kind of like imaginative photos in our mind of a future that we fear, whether it's a future way in the distance or whether it's a future in a circumstance we're in right now, we don't know how it's gonna turn out, but we've got some image in our mind of something we fear that's bringing us anxiety. And those, those mental images are kind of a, they can dominate our lives. What can you do when your mind's images, your mental images, imaginative scenarios of a fearful way this circumstance is going to work out, just keep bombarding you and, and making you anxious about a future that you fear. What, what, what can you do? That's what the Apostle Paul is writing about in the passage we're gonna look at today and his letter he wrote to the ancient Christians in Philippi, we call it Philippians, chapter four, verses four, through seven, but the thing is, on first read, often we read this and think, oh, this is so trite, this is just simplistic platitudes, it just seems way too simplistic when up against the real anxieties in my life. But maybe, maybe that it's our understanding of it that's too simplistic. Let's take a moment and read these verses. Philippians four, four through seven, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
Now again, got an amen. It's the third service. I love that. 11 o'clock service. When we read this, except for the amen guy, uh, maybe the rest of us look at that and think it, that, that just seems like cliche. You know, the Lord is near and you rejoice in the Lord and pray and give you thanks and, and you know, he'll trans. It's it just the peace of God. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And it just seems a little bit simplistic, like the person who wrote this doesn't really understand my, my circumstances, my anxieties. But remember, the person who wrote this, the Apostle Paul, as he's writing this, has been in prison for a long time. He's in prison. And even before he was in prison, he had incredible hardships. He'd been, had, he had beating so bad that often he was left for dead. They literally thought he was dead on the side of the road. He was beaten up so bad. He's had hardships where he was shipwrecked at sea, and he has hard, had hardships where for the most of us, if we had experienced just one of Paul's hardships, it might be a life-changing trauma. But he went through them all the time. And so I, I think that he knows something about how do you face circumstances that are, that are serious, that bring anxiety. And I think what he's saying here is almost it's, it's genius is inside its simplicity. Because what he's saying is, is that, 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 that you have, that you have uh, to create a new mental image in your mind. You know, like these mental images that anxiety creates. Well, you can do the same thing. You can create, you can reframe the mental image of this circumstance in that moment. You can reframe when you're in an anxiety and you have these images that are making you anxious, you can reframe how you're seeing the scenario. And, and what you can do is, is have this sense that you can rejoice in the Lord. And again, that sounds like a cliche, it sounds trite, it sounds like a platitude until you understand what he's thinking when he says that. What he's thinking when he says that is that because he saw the risen Jesus, that there is something very real happening that we don't see but that the God who created this universe is like what the prophet Daniel says in chapter Daniel 5, verse 23, that, that, that the God who created this universe holds in his hand your life and everything else, everything in it. That the God, when he says rejoice in the Lord, rejoice that you're not alone in a random universe. Your circumstances aren't random accidents. Rejoice that the God who created this universe holds your life and everything that's happening in your life in his hand and that he is all in on you. He is for you. And Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, 32, that, that Jesus' death proves that he is for us. He is for you. That the God who created this universe became human so that he could suffer and die to take sin upon himself, take brokenness upon himself, take death itself upon himself into the grave and rise from the dead so that he could reboot your life through a resurrection when he returns in a creating an earth that resurrects as well. That, that the God is, that created this universe is all in and he is for you. So in this moment, you can rejoice even though you can't see him. If you believe what the Bible says and you believe Jesus came and died and rose from the dead, you can rejoice in this moment that the Lord who created this universe holds all your circumstances in his hands and he is for you. And then he says, the Lord is near. Now that sounds like a cliche again, but what he's doing is he's using the same language of the Old Testament that the Lord is near to those who are brokenhearted and, those, and lifts up those who are crushed in spirit. That God, the God who created this universe, the God who created all the galaxies, galaxies that are 13 billion light years away is also with you 100%. We can't understand that. But it's what C.S. Lewis writes in his book, Mere Christianity. Let's read that. He says that God has infinite attention. Now, we don't even understand infinite attention, but what he's saying is God is the God who pays 100% attention to you without paying any less attention to anybody else. That the God who is infinite can pay 100% attention on a piece of dust, on a moon, or on a planet, in a solar system, in a galaxy 13 billion light years away, and he's paying 100% attention to you right now because he's infinite. And so he says, God has infinite attention, infinite leisure to spare for each one of us. 
He doesn't have to take us in the line. That's kind of a British way of saying we don't have to wait in line to talk to God. You're as much alone with him as if you were the only thing he'd ever created. Now, what if you believe that? What if you rejoice in the Lord and all the things that he's in control of and that he is for you and that he is 100% with you and paying attention to you and focused on you as if you were the only thing he ever created? What if you reframed your situation that's making you anxious right now and you believe that about God, that it's, in some sense, it's very real, that it's just you and God and he's paying 100% attention to you? Oh, what would that, what would that, how would that make you see your situation? And then Paul says, that not just that, but don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, pray to God about it because God is paying attention to you. Pray to God, but he says, pray with thanksgiving. And now this is anything but simplistic because it's incredibly counterintuitive. Why would you, why would you, Pray to God and then thank him as you're praying. It doesn't it make more sense to pray to God and then if he answers, if he gives you what you're praying for, that's when you would thank him? But Paul's saying, no, no, that praying to God and, and as you pray, giving thanks is having to wrestle through something. It's saying, I, I believe that whatever God does is in my best interest. I want whatever he does. I'm gonna ask him what I want, talk to him. He wants me to talk to him. He's paying attention, he's with me. He holds everything in my, in my life in his hands. He wants me to ask anything I'm concerned about, but whatever he does, I give thanks. I don't, that's not simplistic at all. Now we really have to wrestle with something. But unless we wrestle with it, we're never gonna have the peace of God. It's like what Jesus had prayed when he, the night before he was arrested. And it says he went to the garden. This is before he's, the night before he's gonna be crucified. He went to the garden and he's praying and he's praying so intense, he's sweating drops of blood. This is an intense prayer of Jesus. And you know what? It's one of the unanswered prayers of Jesus. Let's look at it. In Luke chapter 22, verse 42, Jesus says to the Father, he's praying to God the Father, if you are willing, if it's your will, Take this cup from me. Now, that, this cup is Bible language for this, this suffering that's, that I have to undergo. Take this suffering of the cross from me. He says, Father, if you are willing, if it's your will, take this cross, this crucifixion from me. I don't wanna do it. Let's find another way. Yet not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus is asking something that we're kind of surprised. He's, he's asking God for another way. At the last minute, he's He's freaking out. He's sweating drops of blood. And he's asking God, let's find another way besides the cross. But not my will, but yours be done. And the reason why Jesus, the human, God but human, and he set aside his omniscience, he's praying to the Father because he knows the Father is omniscient. And so he's praying to the Father, look, if there's another way, great. But I want your will, not my will. I don't know. I can't see all things. I want your will, not my will. Now that's a... That's a hard, that's anything but simplistic. That's a really hard thing to have to wrestle with to, the, to get to the point where you could say something like that. It's, it's something that Jesus, in fact, builds right into the Lord's prayer. Your will be done. Your will be done. See, you won't have peace unless you wrestle through this a little bit. Because see, when we're anxious, Anxiety is kind of, somebody once said, I thought it was really good. Anxiety is kind of a presumed omniscience on our part. Omniscience means we know everything. We know how all things are gonna work together. We know what's best for us. I know how this circumstance should turn out that's best for me. I know what's in my best interest, and if it doesn't do that, I know that's not in my best interest. That's kind of a presumed omniscience on our part, but having to wrestle through, not my will, but yours be done, having to wrestle through giving thanks as I pray for God to do something, well, that, that reminds me to acknowledge that only God is omniscient. Only God knows the whole picture, the whole big story, the whole big picture, and how every little second, every little minute is working out to create the big picture and the better future for you. Because remember, he's for you, and he, he controls everything. When you pray, when prayer is up against your real anxieties, 
it's not gonna be a match for your real anxieties unless you wrestle through this where you can actually thank God for whatever he does as you pray. Because see, it's to have the peace of God means that it's a peace that has to transcend our ability to understand it. Paul says, and the peace of God which transcends understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, it must transcend our understanding of what we think is right, what we think ought to happen right now. We have to transcend that and trust in God's omniscience and not our, not our own. Because see, even if, we, even if somehow God pulled back the curtain and showed us how everything's working together, we wouldn't understand it. We wouldn't understand how it all fits together. That's what the author of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, it's a really interesting verse. Chapter three, verse 11 in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, God, he has also set eternity in the human heart. Now, that, what that means is, whether you believe in God or not, whatever your religious beliefs are, it doesn't matter, that everybody has this sense that people are somewhere alive after they die. We have just this intuition. I've heard, I went to an atheist funeral one time, and my friend, staunch atheist, he stood up and said about his dad watching down happy wherever he is, watching what's happening here today. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait you're an atheist. You don't, you don't, but, but he just couldn't help it. He couldn't help talk about his father who died. He's alive somewhere because God has placed eternity in every human heart. We were created to live forever. Sin entered the world and we've died, but God still has, we still have this nature that we think forever is our existence. He's placed it in every human heart and he's going to bring it about, but no one no one can fathom, no one can understand what God has done from beginning to end. If you knew the whole story of, the human, of human history, even before that, if you knew the whole story even of just your life and the way God is moving all the pieces in your life and all the circumstances in your life, all the things in your life that you couldn't possibly know how it's gonna turn out, you couldn't possibly see how this is gonna be for your best interest, but that you trust that God does, even if you could see it all, you wouldn't be able to fathom it. You wouldn't be, even be able to, to understand it. Now, people often ask me, is it okay if I pray for, for this? Can I, should I pray that God like, provides a parking spot downtown on Friday at noon? Can I pray? Is that too little to bother God with? I've heard people say, it just seems too little to bother God with. Now, that's not seeing God as infinitely paying attention to you and for you. And here's my answer. No, you shouldn't pray for parking spots. No, I'm kidding. Here's my answer, is that whatever is causing you to have anxiety, that's what God wants you to pray about. So Paul says, don't be anxious in anything, but in everything, pray. With thanksgiving, whatever makes you anxious, pray. Whatever it is, that's what God wants you to talk to him about. Now, I don't know if they still have in grade school, if they still have gym classes and gym teachers or they just do yoga. I don't know, what, what, I don't know. but when I was in grade school in the 70s, we had a gym teacher and he, he was not trying to be your friend. That was not on his list of things he's trying to do in life to, be, to experience self-actualization. He was not caring about being your friend. What he did is he just had this whistle and he would blow the whistle. He might smile, you know, if you've done something that kind of outperforms somebody else in rope climbing or running or something, he might give you a small smile, but he's blowing his whistle usually and yelling at you what to do next. And sometimes I think that's the view we have of God. It's kind of distant removed aloof and just kind of blowing his whistle and yelling at us for all the things we're doing wrong and yelling at us what we should be doing and it's just kind of that big bad gym teacher in the sky kind of thing. It's kind of our view, but, but this distant idea of God, this aloof idea of God, that's not at all how the disciples of Jesus saw God because they spent time with Jesus. They, they didn't think of God that way at all. Like, for example, Peter, the disciple Peter, he writes a letter we have called 1 Peter. He's got two, we have two of his letters in the New Testament. The first one's called 1 Peter. Chapter five, verse seven, he says, cast all your anxiety on him. Well, why? Well, because he cares for you. 
Whatever it is that's making you anxious, whatever that fearful future is of how this circumstance is gonna work out, those photos in your mind that are bombing you, reframe it. Cast all your anxiety on him, all the things that you can rejoice in the Lord about, and he is with you, and all these things, but because he cares for you. It kind of means two things. It means that he cares about you, like infinitely so. He's really for you, and every detail of your life he cares about, but he's also caring for you. He's taking care of you. And so when we have this idea that, that, that that's who God is and this is the God I'm talking to when I pray in my anxious moment, now all of a sudden we have this sense that I can give thanks for whatever he's going to do because I know he's taking care of me and that he cares for me. I don't have omniscience, but I know he does. So it's hard, it's not easy, but I can give thanks and I can trust Whatever he does is in my best interest. I mean, it's like what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, 28, one of the Bible's greatest hits, where he says, and we know that in all things, all things, nothing outside that box, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, I just want you to put a little pin in that phrase, those who love him. That God in every situation, all things in your life, he's working for the good for those who, who, who love him. And ultimately that good is explained in 1 Corinthians 2.9 where Paul writes this, what no eye has ever seen, what no ear has ever heard, has heard, what no human mind has conceived And here's what no eye has seen nor ear heard nor human mind been able to conceive. The things that God has prepared, all the things that God is working for the good in all things, the things that God has prepared, and here's that phrase again, for those who love him. So when you get into an anxious moment, there's all kinds of ways to see, to frame this situation. But maybe one thing to wrestle through is I wanna focus on loving God more than anything else. And right now, this anxiety is where I have to work through that. I wanna work at wanting God, is another way of saying loving God. I wanna work at wanting God more than anything else, knowing that God is working everything else for my good, for my my best interest. That's, That's what God is doing. Absolutely everything for the good, even the bad things. And some of you are going through really bad things right now, terrible things, really hard things that are, that are causing you to, to maybe be a little bit confused about your beliefs in God even, right now. And here's the thing, we are all going to go through really bad things and then we die. That's just life reality in this Genesis 3 world. But that's not the story. That's just the temporary. The peace of God has to transcend our understanding of how all this is working out. And we just have to trust what the Bible tells us. And we can trust because Jesus came, he died, and he rose again. It's true. Most adults know that if a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old, a 14-year-old, a 15-year-old Right now, they're really going, you know, they're just stressed about something. Their emotions are going through the roof, you know, the hormones and all these things that are happening there. It's kind of a hormone hellhole, a chemical chaos. And these years are really difficult for them to see what you wish they could understand that right now, these things in your life are really small. I know they're big. I know they're exploding emotionally. But after all this smallness, life gets bigger and it gets better. Just trust me. Now, you can say that and they're not gonna understand it. But it's kind of true for us. We're kind of like in that, we're kind of in a world where our emotions get the best of us, our anxious photos get the best of us, but if we could just believe God when he's telling us, look, I know this is anxious anxious time, but this is really small. I'm working everything for good so that I promise you, life is going to get bigger and it's going to get better what no eye has seen nor ear heard nor the human mind been able to conceive what I've prepared for you. It gets better if you just trust me. I saw this, I saw this. (laughs) 
It's hard to believe it. I'm not trying to trivialize it. But this is Paul who really understands anxiety and this is what he's trying to tell us. I watched a video of the streets in Amsterdam. This is a video uh, uh, that's actually a film that was restored through AI. And, and you know, you see this street of Amsterdam and it's 102 years ago. And all these people are going about their lives really busy. And you know, they've got things that they're thinking about. They've got pursuits. They've got, maybe some of them have things that they're anxious about in this photo. They don't look too anxious. But you know, you have, everybody has their lives. Here's the thing. 102 years later, all of us are looking at this. Not a single person in this film is alive. And not a single person they know is alive. And not a single anxiety they have matters at all right now because see, everything in their life, not just their life, but everything in their life has completely disappeared. And we're looking 100 years, 102 years back and none of it matters. The things that were so big to them I just wonder if we can kind of see our circumstances now from 102 years in the future. Looking back from 102 years in the future, we're all gonna be dead. There's not gonna be anybody here who's alive. We're all gone. And the things that you think really matter and all the anxieties of the fearful future, 102 years from now, you're gonna say, just just trust God. Trust me, trust God. He's gonna work it out. 102 years later, we're gonna say, it it, it doesn't matter as much as you think. What matters is will you love God and will you trust in him and know that he's omniscient and that he is with you and that he is all in on you and your future is amazing. Trust me, God says. So let's stand and sing now about what we've just heard.